in line with what my brother just mentioned, I ask you, what have you come here for? What are you preparing to do in these next 14 weeks? Or if you're just starting today over the next years here at Puritan Seminary, what are we as professors and staff about? What are we aiming to do here in these weeks and in our lives? Among all the answers that we can give to this question, and there are all sorts of answers we can give, I hope that what we particularly and essentially aim at is something that you and I already do by God's grace. It's something that we have the great calling and privilege of doing, and that is encapsulated in the words that you find in verse 20 of Ephesians 4, which I'll read at this time once again. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Our topic today is what it's all about, learning Jesus. What it's all about, learning Jesus. We'll see two thoughts, what that means and how that's done. What it's all about, learning Jesus, what and how. In this section of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, he's been picturing the great contrast between the old life of sin and the new life of holiness and the fear of God. And this contrast is an absolute one. It's one of darkness and light. And that means that as the people of God, we are to stand apart also from that old life that we once lived. You see, by nature, we walk in darkness and have no light. We walk in the vanity or the uselessness of our own minds. And when this is your life, you, you really don't know any better. Paul speaks of this in, in verse 18, having the understanding darkened. That means there's, there's no light, no light essentially in our minds and in our hearts. Through our fall into sin, this is how we live. Something's been extinguished. The lights have gone out. And that's what our life is apart from God and his grace. We're estranged from God. We're alienated from the life of God. And, and that's what explains our life apart from Christ. And that's, that's what explains our world around us as well. The deepest problem of our world is not the things that they do or say, but it's simply this, they're estranged from God, they're strangers to God, and because of that, all sorts of other things issue forth, and, and Paul is concrete about them. There's sensuality, there's impurity, there's greed, there's falsehood. Apart from God, we are dull, we're calloused, we're hardened to the realities of life, and we grow further into that, until we're past feeling, it says. And it's all because we don't know God. Oh, how necessary it is that people know God and that we know God and know him more and more, that we're not estranged from him, but that we become familiar with him, friends of God. Is that possible? Yes, by grace. This is the life to which we're called. And it's so diametrically opposed to the old life. And that's why Paul says here, but you, but you have not so learned Christ. You, if you're a Christian, you stand opposed to this. By grace, God has made a difference where there was none. God has made all things new. Instead of being vain and callous and estranged from God, you now have been brought into the fellowship with God, into friendship with God, and your life is marked by a new reality, righteousness, holiness, verse 24. There is a new creation. The image of God, which is Christ, is, is before you. It's in you by grace. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, what, what brings this change about? in our lives? How can our darkened, alienated minds, how can they taste this freshness, this new reality of righteousness and holiness? Well, there's two words, learning Jesus. 
Now, God has graciously revealed himself in the textbook all around us, in nature, in general revelation. What a majestic book that is. It speaks of the power and the wisdom and the majesty and the goodness of God. And besides that, we have the authoritative textbook of special revelation, which is a living word in which God still speaks. It's not so that God just spoke in times past and that's now buried in archives and, and in a book or a collection of books, 66 books, which is how God spoke then. No, God speaks through his word still today. It's a living word. It gives life. It is alive. It makes for life. It brings about life and peace and communion with God. And at its very center, there is the living Jesus who comes clothed in his word and meets us, steals up upon us often, whispers or calls or invites or even shouts or cries into our lives as wisdom incarnate, revealing the father and saying, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. And in him are all the treasures of wisdom, all in him. And life becomes all about learning Jesus. And note well, that doesn't mean simply knowing about Jesus or about Christ. Many stop there. And obviously there are things that we need to know about him. The Bible says much about him, who he is, what he's done, what he still does in heaven on our behalf, what he's taught us. But learning Christ is so much more. It's an infinitely different reality. Learning Jesus. The closest expression that Paul uses elsewhere in his writings is knowing Christ, knowing Jesus. He says in Philippians 3, that I might know him. That is his life deepest yearning, his lifelong design to know Christ. But here he uses the expression learning Christ, which draws attention to the process that, that is underway when we do seek to know the Lord Jesus. He's using here the metaphor that we're all used to and that we're all about here in the seminary, and that is the process of learning things. And that means unlearning things as well. And it's a rigorous process. Learning often starts very small, and, and initially it may be very difficult, as uh, some of you will soon find with Hebrew or Greek or uh, systematics or homiletics, whatever it may be. Uh, you're stretched when you learn. You... Just like a child, you, you pull yourself up, but then you fall again. Learning is with falling and, and, and rising. And it involves focus. And, and you have to discipline yourself. And you have to pull yourself up when you feel lazy and, and at ease and, and coasting. Learning involves practicing. Learning involves correction and discipline. Learning involves exams that reveal our deficiencies. Learning is humbling, and yet learning is glorious. It's wonderful to learn Christ. It strengthens us. It invigorates us. But it's not always easy. We're confronted with still so much in us that is old, that is dark, that is alienated, that doesn't want the knowledge of God. And that needs to be exposed. And this principle of learning Christ needs to grow and needs to fight the darkness within. You have not so learned Christ. Paul is reminding these Ephesians that their life, what they sometimes tend to do, how they, they trip up in their life, that's not what the knowledge of Christ in them aims at. It's not consistent with the life of learning Christ, and that's a reality as well. Once we're Christians, it's not just some, some, some going from, 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 from this height to that height and, and on and on. No, there are times when... Christ, the teacher, meets us and faces us like he did Peter and looked upon him. And we know it in an instant. 
We are not living consistent with the knowledge of Christ, with the learning of Christ. You have not so learned Christ. Have you ever had those piercing eyes of the Savior look at you and say, is this what I've taught you? Is this what it is to learn me? We have not so learned Christ. But that also means that there is a life that issues from this knowledge of Christ. There is a pattern of life that evidences whether we've learned Christ and whether we're growing in that knowledge of Christ. You see, if we're making excuses for sin in our life, we have not so learned Christ. If we imagine that Christ will not conquer sin in our lives, we have not so learned Christ. If we are not wanting to put on the old man, we have not so learned Christ. If there is sloth and straying in our hearts, which there is and there will be, but we have not so learned Christ. That's the great test. And that's the great call and aim. And so there is a, a great process also here at seminary in which you come in as, as beginners, at least some of us beginners. We don't know so much. And yet we're excited and we're learning and, and we're falling and stumbling and rising again and we're being stretched. Kind of like those disciples on the road to Emmaus. They had been so excited to sit at the feet of the Lord Jesus and to learn so many things, but the day came when all their hope was gone. We had hope, they said. Their expectation was dead, buried gone along with the Lord Jesus whom they thought was forever gone. We had hoped you might face a day like that in the semester where you said, where you say, I had hoped to become a minister. I'd hoped to be a counselor. I'd hoped to attain to something. We had hoped you've not so learned Christ because Christ comes and is already alongside these people walking to Emmaus, a stranger initially, but he's teaching them. He's opening up the scriptures. He's opening up himself and he's opening their hearts and something happens whereby in the review, they say was not our heart on fire while he talked with us, while we were learning him, why were we getting to know him? May that happen. In all of the ups and downs and vicissitudes of the semester, you look back and even in those hard times when the professor took you apart and sat you down and said, something's not adding up, something's going wrong here and, and your hopes get dashed and, and crushed, yet Jesus is there. And even in that, he's teaching you and he's rekindling something that we put out as the almighty God in Jesus Christ is so able to do. You see, learning Christ means that Jesus is the lesson. I don't know who are the most famous violinists today. When I was growing up, Yehudi Menuhin was a famous skilled violinist and people who could study under him, they learned violin. They learned from the master. And when they played, at least this is what they aimed for. They, they, they aimed at this, that people could hear from how they played the violin. They could hear the masters playing in them and through them, so to speak. It's just a small picture. But that's what learning Christ ultimately aims at, is that as people look at us by God's grace, and we don't see this in ourselves at all, because we, in comparison to him, are, the, are like this but that we are so learning Christ that the teacher is the lesson and the lesson is the skill and the skill is something that evidences itself in you. And he is Christ and you're a Christian. He is anointed and you share in that anointing and you follow him and you reflect him and you're learning him. Learning Christ is a profound lesson. It's a deep lesson. You never get done with this. It will truly take a whole eternity to learn it. 
And we'll never get out of that. But it's also, and don't mistake this, it's a simple lesson as well. It's not something for which you have to climb into the depths or climb up to heaven. Nicodemus was a, was a master in Israel, and yet the Lord had to, to, to told him that he had to be born again and to become like a little child. He was too learned in this world's wisdom. He needed to step down from that height. The wayfaring man, though a fool, shall not err in the way of holiness. We need to learn at the feet of the Lord Jesus. It's a profound and simple lesson. It's also a comforting lesson. The lessons learned at the feet of Jesus are filled with comfort. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, says your God. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her, your warfare is done. Your iniquity is pardoned. You've received from the Lord's hand double for all your sins. And that's what Christ is teaching to us. He's pouring comfort into our soul. There's no lesson in life that is more comforting than the lessons that Christ is willing to teach. And yet at the same time, they're challenging and convicting and continual lessons as well. They're lessons that change us and transform us. There's a refining that goes on. But in it all, as we go along and seek more and more to learn Christ, there is something that is built into us in the sense of we know his voice. We know him. And the more others try to shake us from that knowledge, the more Satan whispers or screams into our ear against Christ, the more we've learned from Christ, the more steadied, the more secure it is. Spurgeon said, you might as well challenge that I have no mother than to tell me I have no Christ because I know my mother. I know her voice. I know her touch. I know what she's done for me. And I know God. And I know Christ. I know his tenderness. I know his love. I know that he is the high priest of my profession. I know he's the intercessor of my life. I know he's risen because I spoke with him this morning. You can't tell me. He's not real and he's not there. Learning Christ is what it's all about. But how to do this, secondly and more briefly? Paul tells us this really in three, three lines here in our text. Verse 21, but ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. So first of all, it means hearing him, listening to him. Notice it doesn't say listening to others speak about him. Obviously that's involved, but listening to him, if so be that you have heard him. And Paul's writing here to Ephesian believers who had never met Christ. They had never heard Christ in the flesh. They didn't know Christ according to the flesh, but they had heard him. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And so what he's saying here is we need to have that communion wherein we hear Christ speaking through his word. We're not talking about a mystical voice apart from the scriptures. But we're talking about that voice, that unmistakable voice of the Son of God in our nature who calls us through his word, who speaks to us. When we're confounded, he directs us. When we're sinning, he convicts us. He sends his spirit to guide us through his word. He calls our name, Mary, Simon, whatever it is. He speaks to us. Have you heard him? Do you hear him? In all honesty, I think some of us have to say that. Sometimes times go by when we hear his voice. We're deaf and dull to them. Or God, for all wise reasons, withdraws his, his voice, that close voice. But he's still speaking. He's right there. Even when Mary in the garden 
thought they had taken away her Lord and she didn't know where he was. He was right there behind her. And his voice she recognized when he called her name. That's what we should aim for in the semester, is to hear his voice. But secondly, it involves union with him. The second part in our text says, and have been taught by him. And literally it says in him, in union with him, united to him. We are taught in union with Christ in that intimate relationship by faith. That Christ engages with us and, 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 and we, we take up with him. We are united to him. As husband and wife, wife and husband are united. There's a familiarity. There's a commitment. There's a love. There's an intimacy. There, there's a respect. There's a self-sacrifice. There's a union which grows. And so it is with the Lord Jesus Christ. And anyone can have that union. It's not simply for the wise and prudent. But it's for babes. It's for sinners. It's for you and me and aim for that and look for that and grow in that union with Christ. Be careful for those things that take away from emphasizing that union, that distract you from that. The esteem of men, the accolades of people, the voices that drown out the voice of the Savior. No communion with the Lord Jesus through his spirit. He says, my words are spirit and they are life. When we're united to him, we have him. We embrace him. We know him. So we hear him. We're united to him. And then there's this remarkable thing with which we'll close and or with our text closes, as the truth is in Jesus, as the truth is in Jesus. It's as, it's as if Paul here is tracing out this process of, of learning, learning Christ. Christ is the lesson. Christ is the teacher. And he, in his mind, all of a sudden, he just plunks himself, reverently speaking, on Christ. As the truth is in Jesus, it's in him. It's in him, the son of God in our nature. It's in him and it's in Jesus. Do you hear that? He uses the personal name of Jesus. He's used to the official name Christ in the previous verse, but here there's such familiarity that he calls Jesus by his personal name as the truth is in Jesus. All truth is in him. It leads us back to him. It resides in him. And it's known in communion with him. And so when you find truth, find it in Jesus and acknowledge Jesus and praise Jesus for this. When we find holiness, it's in him. When we know wisdom, it's in him. When we see patience, it's all in him and so much more. Someone was once asked what they thought about someone else and the person said, I can't tell you. I've never lived with him. I love that. It's when you live with someone that you truly know them. Live with Jesus. Live in Jesus. And you'll know him. And you'll speak to others about him. And you'll learn Jesus. Everything holds together in Jesus. And may this hub of everything, namely Jesus. May that be there in this semester and all our days. May we know by God's grace in community, may we know what it's all about, learning Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we ask thee that thou wouldst give us this semester to grow in this knowledge of the Lord Jesus, to hear his voice, to be united to him, to find everything in him, and to know
what it is to have that communion and that familiarity with the Lord Jesus all by grace through faith. Pray, Lord, for every single person here. We also pray, Lord, for those times in which all this seems far and remote. We long for it, but we can't get it. We can't bring ourselves there, and yet you're standing right beside us. You're that stranger who speaks by the way. You're that gardener, so to speak, behind us, calling our name. We pray for ears to hear it. And we ask the Lord to bless our time together further today. Bless every single person here and gladden our hearts with your presence. In Jesus' name alone, amen.